The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored in part by Robinson's General Store in Middle Arm, Noble's Timber Mart with locations in Springdale and Bay Vert, Knife and Axe found at Young and Mackenzie. .ca. Outdoor Pros located in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland. Welcome back to another episode of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. Today we're going to be doing some woodworking. One of my favorite hobbies. So relaxing, so enjoyable compared to some of my other hobbies. Uh, we have this beautiful piece of cherry here. What we're going to be working on today is making a wooden mallet. Now what we have right here is a dandy set of carpenter's chisel. So this is a standard size chisel. Common. Notice the real short tang here. The tang stop right here. These are made by Fuller. These are, this is a nice little set. Uh, these are made in Canada. If you're looking for a cheaper option, the Fuller ones are, are some of the best in my opinion. But this is the type of chisel that probably most of you are used to seeing. Just your standard carpenter's chisel. And they work great, but they're not the best for woodworking. And in my opinion, they're not very classy. However, these have fiberglass or hard plastic handles like this molded and these are super tough. You can pound on these chisels with pretty much whatever you want. If you have just your, your carpenter's claw hammer, steel hammer, you can pound away at these and usually they won't break unless you're in real cold temperatures or something and they're real brittle. Now all of these beautiful chisels right here, these are my woodworking chisels. All of these were saved from the the depths of despair and I just absolutely love these. I love restoring chisels, I love finding them, but there are not many around. I think it's because chisels undergo such hard work, hard use, and they were just never valued. So they were just uh, completely destroyed and if they did remain after a while, they were used just as paint can openers and things like that and they were just wasted away. And if you do still have them, they're probably paint can openers for you, so I hope you're not doing that. But like I said, all of these were picked up individually by me, whether from uh, just buying off of someone or finding in the garbage, junk piles, yard sales, different things like that, rusted up old chisels, to which I cleaned, heavily cleaned. Uh, some of them I turned out handles. These three here I turned out wooden handles for. Look at this beautiful two-inch slick right here all socket chisels. Like I said, I love these, but they require a bit of a delicate touch. As you're pounding on these handles, you don't want to be using like your metal claw hammer. Now right here is where I keep my different striking tools. So I have a nice little set of three ball pins, three different sizes. All three have been restored. I have two claw hammers and I have two mallets. One is a rubber mallet and the other, check out this one, this one here is a brass mallet that was given to me by a good friend of mine that he made himself the head. Now I uh, lathed out this birch handle for it and hung it with a nice little wedge there but this is a beautiful little mallet and I thought it was going to be my chisel mallet. Uh, it's certainly handy for a lot of things but it's not the best for running chisels I found out. It's just the face is kind of small and when I'm using a chisel I'm usually not looking at my chisel. I'm looking down at the workpiece so it just gets a little bit uncomfortable with that really small strike face. So now long story short, what we need to get to making is a carpenter's mallet. Now this is not going to be a mallet that you'd also use for beating the ice off the bottom of your truck or, uh, or, or pounding at a fence post out in the back. This is going to be a fine woodworking tool, so we're going to make it real classy, real nice, use some good materials, uh, the hardest materials we can get to make a nice hardwood mallet. So here's what I've come up with. It's probably not to scale. I didn't measure it to scale. But we're going to have a 3x3 three three face. What I have here is a full dimension 1 inch cherry wood. So I'm going to cut out uh, 3 inch by 1 inch by 6 inch pieces of, uh, of cherry. Three of those. And then we're going to cut a piece out of that middle. And you'll be able to see eventually that this middle is going to be tapered inside. So these, these two middle pieces, this will be two separate pieces here that will laminate and allow the handle to go up through between them and we want it as an opening so when our handle comes up like this and comes up through like this when we drive our wedge down between this material opens up and fills out that hole so the handle can't back 
out of the head. That'll give us a perfectly tight fit. I think our handle will be that one inch cherry as well, probably with an octagonal. Gives a nice feel on the hand, a nice, nice bit of traction. Now depending on how heavy this head is, once we cut out those pieces and I kind of get a feel for it, we may be doing something really interesting inside this head that you'll want to stick around for. Now, I should note that we'll be using only hand tools to do this project, which makes me even more excited. The first thing I'm going to do is plane off that face just so we have a smooth reference surface to measure from. This is a footprint number four plane. Now if I'm being honest here, another reason I want to do this project is so I get to play with a few new tools I got for Christmas that I haven't had a good word woodworking opportunity to really use yet. One of them is this Veritas marking wheel gauge which is absolutely gorgeous. It's a little complex to work with at first, but it is awesome. What you have here is this uh, is this rod with six inches worth of markings, and you have this entire assembly here at the top that moves back and forth. You have a razor blade wheel here on the end. That's your exact zero point. Then this reference face marks from that. So we want exactly three inches. So I'll lock this face down at three inches. So now you can just kind of roll or slide in that measurement. This cherry feels kind of sticky, so it doesn't want to slide that blade through there very well. And you have just the finest dimension possible. I have to rip full one inch material here. So what I'm going to use is my Distin D8. This is a five and a half point rip saw. A very aggressive saw. You don't want to use it on just any project, but this is certainly a project that it'll work nicely for. You see that saw is chattering as it's drawing back and forth. That's because my plate is drawing. If I were to throw a little bit of oil on that, it would slick through the wood instead of chattering its way through. So now my 10 point per inch distance. Cutting off our first six inch piece here. Now we decided that the middle piece inside the two outside slabs of the of the mallet head is going to be angled so that when our handle goes up through here like this and butts up against this, we can put a wedge down in here. This will flare out into this triangle void so the handle can't back out of the head. It stays nice and tight. Now what we need to find out is what kind of an angle we want to put on here so we can be accurate and get a nice tight joint. Now we can do a couple calculations to do this. We can treat this as sort of a right angle triangle here. We know that the depth of our mallet head is three inches. And I'm going to say that I want it wedged out to a quarter inch total. So that means an eighth of space on each side of the head. If we want to measure, since we're measuring inches, it's probably easier to use a decimal. So an eighth is 0 0.125 of an inch, which will be this dimension and this dimension here. Now that we have these two dimensions, we should be able to go and find out this angle right here. If any of you young gaffers are watching, you could use something like Sokotoa, and you could use, say, 10x equals opposite over adjacent here. So we could use 10 of whatever angle. You're going to need a calculator for this. But we'd use our opposite, which is 0 0.125, over our adjacent to the x, which is 3. Now we can do 0 0.125 divided by 3 equals, so we have 10x equals 0 0.417, 0 0.0417, sorry. Now, since we have 10x to find x, we just take the inverse of 10. So let's see, 10 inverse, 0 0.0417 equals, so 
x or this angle equals 2.4 degrees roughly. So that means if you have something like an angle calculator here that measures, we can go to center zero. Then we can open up to 90 plus our 2.4 degrees. Require that much exactness because your cut is probably going to be off by at least a decimal or two of its degrees, but at least now we know we're pretty close, or we're going to be pretty close to having an eighth of an inch on each side of the piece of material. So one line down here, make sure we have plenty of excess on each side, that way we don't have any wastage, we don't need to cut out two of these angles, make this one cut, and then we may a cut set here somewhere, and we can flip those and we'll have a perfect opening that opens up uh, in surplus of a quarter inch total from the top to the bottom. Now hopefully I can cut this angle with some level of accuracy. I'll do my very best. So there we have it now with a little bit of math you can see that we open up to a nice opening on the top to take a wedge. Now once these go on here, I, you see how I cut it with excess, these will go on something like this, picture it in a neater fashion. We have a smaller hole at the bottom so we'll go up through, we'll wedge open, now we can flush cut these off to all one nice dimension. I'm thinking after I get it glued, I'll do that. Really liking it so far. The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored in part by Robinson's General Store in Middle Arm, Noble's Timber Mart with locations in Springdale and Bay Vert, Knife and Axe found at Young and McKenzie .ca. Outdoor Pros, located in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland. Now I mentioned earlier that I had an idea that we might do something real unique inside the head. But uh, I can tell at this point that I'm definitely not going to do that. One thing you can do, uh, if you've seen the dead blow style hammer before, that big heavy rubber shot mallet, and you give it a shake and you hear that sh 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 inside, that is like uh, lead pellets or lead shot inside. Now what I was thinking about doing, and I've seen this before, this is not my idea, is milling out or augering out a hole here in each one or each of these sides if this mallet head was too light and epoxing full of lead shot and that uh, by removing that say inch uh, diameter hole there and filling it with lead shot that would add quite a bit more weight than just the wood. I was going to do that if we were too light but by the size of this mallet head and how dense and weighty that cherry is I can tell we're definitely not going to do that but if you try this yourself building one of these and uh, you use a wood that's lighter, say birch that tends to be real light or, or hickory that's extremely light for its, for its volume, that might be an idea you want to try out. Now the only other thing I'm going to do here before I glue up is take a little small gouge and in this glue face I'm just going to make some small gouges, just shallow ones like so and that is just some pockets for more glue to sit so I don't get a dry joint just a little bit of area for the glue to grip in because I'll put a nice bit of clamping pressure on this and I don't want to squeeze out all my glue make sure I don't get those anywhere near where my handle will come up through there we go just some aggressive little slots keep some glue in that joint. Gouges here are something else that are really hard to find, even harder than chisels in my experience. Okay, here's one of the exciting parts. Now since I have only planed one reference face on every surface that I measure from, that means everything has to sit 
on that reference face. Otherwise, uh, that angle could be off, anything could be off, if not. So, we can start doing glue up now. I have this block of granite here. That's what I'll uh, rely on to be my accurate surface. Way more glue than I need. Okay. Reference face at the bottom. Yep. Roughly match material from front to back. Over this way a little bit. Now let's flip it over on its bottom. And now, like I said, we can take advantage of that reference surface. We can push everything down. Now with a little bit of movie magic, we are back with an all dried up, all ready to go mallet. Isn't that nice? You guys didn't have to wait a bit. So it's looking really, really great. This is our flush side, that top. It's looking nice. Here's the bottom side. As you can see that uh, because those weren't planed off faces, we got a little bit of material to move there, but that is just fine. We also have a bunch of excess here and we need to cut that off. That's our first step right now, is to cut off this excess. Now mallet heads like this usually don't have squared off faces. They aren't square with, with the top and bottom. They're usually angled in a little bit. Now mallet you can use of course both sides, but uh, they're usually angled in kind of like, like this, so the, the bottom side is narrower. And that is so you don't need as parallel of an angle with you don't need to hit at your chisel with a 90 you can be down a little lower than your chisel and it just gets you gives you a little bit more of a relaxed working stance so we're going to cut these off on an angle here is about what I want to go with so this line right here you can see it's not a super steep angle but it's just enough that it will definitely make a difference while we're working so get as much materials I can out of this right out to that front edge Now there is one dimension right here on this side we need to take off almost a quarter inch of material but since it's all with the grain I'm just going to go ahead and plane it down. I'm not going to use the saw. A plane will chop down a quarter inch of this material. Very quick. Set my iron out nice and deep. the way we want to be. Oh, that cherry is such beautiful wood. And we are going right.
This is the current progress. You can see now that we have it nice and slim in the center. Just nice for the hand. Uh, right about where we want it. I did end up doing a palm swell on the hand or on the end here just because it would be awkward if it went narrow and stayed narrow off the back. So this feels great here now. And it looks good. I think it looks good. It's as symmetrical as I can get it. It's still octagonal. So that's why I created this face first and then I did a 45 chamfer on each of the outsides. So really like it. Okay, that's a better fit. Nice and tight, but Now because of our little bit of math, this is our situation. We have double the wedge distance or about quarter inch of material, an eighth on each side, which is just what we want. Our black walnut wedge. Now I've cut the wedge a little bit stout because we do not want the wedge to bottom out before it uh, completely fills that joint. So I kind of undercut it the other way. Now this should work. This should work. And now for one of the most exciting parts of the project, and that is oiling. And since we planed off all the surfaces and didn't sand them, that means you have all open end pores of the wood. Your wood all comes, runs through almost like fiber optic if you want to compare it to something. And then the ends are open pores. Fluids transfer back, be back and forth between cells and whatnot. And uh, once you sand those, you mash dust into all of those pores, and then you lose that definition. Oil doesn't take as well, but when you scrape them and plane them instead, you're left with all those open fibers. So when you add a bit of oil like this, the wood really drinks it in. And there it is, our finished mallet made with all that cherry wood. The only thing different is that black walnut wedge, which I think looks phenomenal in there. Is this project perfect? No, it is absolutely not. There are a ton of flaws in there, just like with all of my projects. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you guys, the audience, so much for watching. I really hope you learned something in this project, or at minimum, I hope that you were entertained. I want to give a big shout out to my sponsors. You've seen those a couple times throughout this episode. They really help in making this show possible and helping support me throughout. That's it for this week. Please tune in next week to the Newfoundland Hobbyists.